potential contamination of aquifers. Uh, in some areas, uh, water, you know, West Texas, um, most of the West, uh, water supplies are, are scarce. Uh, methane leakage from wells is a real concern because methane is an even more potent uh, greenhouse gas than is um, CO2. And if methane's leaking, then it can offset the benefit of uh, switching from coal to natural gas. And the one I wanted to spend some time talking about is, is earthquake triggering associated with the injection of flowback water. Now, there's a lot of noise in the press about the chemicals used in frac fluids, and they should all be disclosed, and uh, it's, a, it's a shame that they haven't been before now. Um, they're really fairly benign, but the water that comes back afterwards, so you, you do the fracking, you inject all this water, and then you flow it back to get it out of the way because it basically will block the gas from flowing. And the water that comes back is very salty and has things like arsenic and selenium and naturally occurring radioactive materials. And that water has to be dealt with in an environmentally responsible way. The most common way of dealing with the water is to inject it. And in a number of places around the country, that injection has been triggering earthquakes. But all of this goes under the, you know, the no fracking, no fracking. Um, in, in fact, it's actually not the hydraulic fracturing itself that's the problem, but it's been a rallying cry for people who just don't like the oil and gas industry or who think we can simply switch to wind and solar overnight without you know, tremendous economic disruption. So um, you know, there is real concern, and, and there's essentially no development in most of Western Europe because of the concerns about the safety and the environmental impact. And of course, Yoko's against it. So I mean, you know, actually, I'm still mad at her about breaking up the Beatles. And so, uh, you know, I really don't care. In 2011, I had the pleasure of serving on a small committee for the Secretary of Energy, who was asked by the president, who had become aware of the, you know, the enormous potential benefit of these shale gas resources, he was asked a simple question, and that was whether or not these resources could be developed while protecting public health and the environment. And that was our charge to answer that simple question. There were seven of us, um, a very diverse committee, and, and we, we were unanimous in saying that, yes, shale gas can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. but. We also made 20 recommendations about how things um, you know, should be done better to kind of assure the public and to protect the public and to protect the environment. Um, and a number of those recommendations are, are being followed, uh, not nearly as many as, as I would like to see followed. But full disclosure of the fluids being used, full manifesting of all the fluids from start to finish was uh, one of our recommendations. Uh, I wrote a paper with a colleague from the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, Doug Arendt. Uh, last month was published by, the, uh, by what's called The Bridge. It's a quarterly publication of the National Academy of Engineering in which we try to kind of update some of those issues. And this circle and uh, four quadrants, which you cannot read, uh, describe different domains of environmental issues that have to be dealt with. And so, um, you know, we uh, are very strong proponents of the use of natural gas and its potential use as a bridge fuel to a decarbonized energy future. But we don't want to make any mistake about not um, recognizing how many uh, issues have to be dealt with. So with respect to potential contamination of aquifers, uh, the biggest concern is that hydraulic fractures are going to grow up from the depth of the shale, as I said before, uh, typically about 7,000 feet. I'll show you some data in a moment, um, to the aquifers. And the answer is that this is not happening, has never happened, and won't happen as long as the shales are sufficiently deep. Now, that has been the case to date for the North American shale plays, but there are some places where the shales are shallow, and that situation could change. And so it's not clear that all shales can be developed. And uh, the depth of the shale is uh, actually important in isolating the reservoir um, from, from the biosphere. So this looks like a complicated figure. It's really pretty, pretty simple. There are 2,000 or so wells. The depth of the Barnett Shale, this is in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, where it all started, is shown by a red line that uh, progresses from right to left. Um, it's maybe a little bit hard to see. And the wells are simply ordered um, 
by, by the depth of the shale. So the shallowest are about 5,000 feet and the deepest are about 9,000 feet, okay? The blue lines along the top indicate the depths from which water is being produced from a, a USGS uh, a website, it's available. And the spiky signal shows where these little micro-earthquakes are occurring. So the shallowest micro-earthquake, you know, is a thousand or so feet above the shale and the deepest are a couple thousand feet below the shale. So you can, you know, so the hydrofracks do go, grow up and they also grow down uh, in some cases, but they don't grow up anywhere close to uh, where the, um, the water is being produced. And there hasn't been a single case in which frac fluids have been found, you know, in, in contaminated aquifers. But there are contaminated aquifers, and I'll come to that in a moment. But you can imagine that if you took this line with all the data and you just, you know, just moved it up by a few thousand feet and you didn't have that separation, this might not be a, a safe thing to do in, in such areas. The utilization of scarce water supplies is an issue. But it's, it's an issue that can be dealt with. The, the companies like to frack with fresh water. They like to drill with fresh water because it's simply easier, easier cleanup. Um, you know, equipment doesn't rust and so on. But every offshore well that's ever been drilled has been drilled with salt water. If they're, when they're hydraulically fractured, they're hydraulically fractured with salt water. And this shows a drill site in um, the Horn River area. Horn River is at the very northern border of British Columbia. It's very remote. Nobody lives there, and there were no water supplies. So the company, <coughs> excuse me, Apache, uh, drilled four, four wells into saline aquifers, and they drilled with saline water, they fracked with saline water, and then the flowback water was injected back into these saline aquifers. So there was you know, no problem uh, whatsoever. And so that is always an option. Methane leakage from wells is, is an important issue. It's actually turning out that methane leakage is, is a, a serious problem, but it's mostly coming from pipelines and distribution systems. Uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford, uh, Rob Jackson, who's just moved to Stanford from Duke, has done street-by-street -street surveys of Boston and Washington, D.C., and the two places are leaking like a sieve has nothing to do with shale gas. It has to do with 100-year-old infrastructure. I mean, we're, we're transporting gas through pipelines that are 100 years old. And, you know, there, uh, uh, well, we all know about the San Bruno explosion. Uh, a couple months ago, a, a, an apartment house in Harlem blew up, and that apartment house was blown up due to a leaking gas system that was literally 100 years old. Now, in places where that's not happening, and we actually look at shale gas itself, this is uh, from the Barnett Shale, again, 16,000 wells. This is work from, from NREL in, in Boulder. Um, what everything sort of put on a normalized scale, so the, the vertical axis is the effect on global warming, and, the, uh, and then different classes of energy sources are shown. But the, the best we, kn we know from the studies done to date, natural gas has half the effect, half the effect of coal on global warming. And so switching, from natural uh, switching to natural gas is a very um, important thing to do. Um, so what causes the contamination I referred to before and the leakage uh, if it does occur? I, I know you can't read this table. It's from Resources for the Future, a large environmentally oriented NGO. And what they did was a survey of what are the biggest problems. And they asked the companies themselves, they asked environmental groups, they asked academics, and they asked regulators. And those are the, the, the columns. And when you look at the, you know, what they, what these groups from very diverse backgrounds, very different special interests, all agreed about is that the problems we have to worry about are related to well construction. When the wells are not cased and cemented properly, they pose a danger to the workers, they pose the danger of methane leakage, they pose the danger of contamination of aquifers. And one of the uh, recommendations of our 2011 committee was the importance of adopting best practices, having good regulations, and enforcing those regulations on well construction. Um, we know what a well constructed well sh should look like. You know, the gas should flow to the surface. There shouldn't be any interaction with higher formations, but in fact, 
you know, this is not often done. This is a, uh, uh, from a paper by George King. George King, uh, coincidentally, also worked for Apache Corporation. And he's done several thousand frack jobs. And yet he points out that using sort of schematic geology from western Pennsylvania, he says, well, if you follow API practice, the American Petroleum Institute, you put surface casing down to 500 feet and you cement it into place to protect the aquifers. And that's normally good enough. But when you have coal seams, which might be producing a little bit of gas, or shales that might be producing a little bit of gas but are uneconomic, they put gas into the, the space between, you know, because it's not all cemented, um, which would solve the problem in most places. But um, they, um, it, it would put gas into the annulus of the well, and, and if the gas comes up, then there's only that one, you know, one uh, casing and cement to protect the aquifers. So what George recommends is that when this is the case, we have multiple barriers, you know, multiple casings, multiple cement barriers. And um, in that way, if any one barrier is problematic, there's a backup and we, um, we reduce the problem. And really the solution to you know, the underground environmental impacts of shale gas production have to do with well construction, well construction, and well construction. We know how to do it, but there's simply not sufficient regulatory control. Of Most operators are very responsible, not all operators are, and those are the ones uh, that have to be uh, you know, where, where the problems are going to occur. Okay, so let me come back, come to this earthquake issue. Uh, we live in earthquake country. It's a, a, a topic on all of our minds. In 2012, I was asked to write a paper by the American Geological Institute about all those earthquakes that were occurring due to fluid injection in 2011. Youngstown, Ohio had earthquakes. Guy, Arkansas had earthquakes. Continuing earthquakes had been occurring on the Dallas-Fort Worth airport for a couple of years. And some sizable earthquakes had occurred uh, near Trinidad, Colorado, um, associated with uh, coal bed methane. Um, anyway, they inject a lot of water. It's not shale gas, but it's another form of producing natural gas. Not long after I wrote the paper, um, it was argued that three magnitude five plus earthquakes in um, Prague, Oklahoma were triggered by injection. Then it was a uh, paper came out about injection related earthquakes in Snyder, Texas, Timpson, Texas, and just last fall, a whole series of earthquakes were shaking up a little community uh, called Azel, Texas. There's a lot going on. Now we've understood injection related earthquakes for over 50 years, and it all started at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal where the Army was injecting wastewater uh, from chemical weapon you know, um, manufacturing. And um, they, start, they were injecting this water. Earthquakes were occurring uh, east of Denver. Uh, they denied everything, but um, a, a local geologist, David Evans, kept at it and demonstrated uh, in the black line that the earthquakes were occurring, the black histogram on the left, where the earthquakes were occurring when they were injecting kind of the uh, the stippled histogram just below it. When they slow down injection, the earthquakes slow down. They start injecting, the earthquakes come back. They go through a period of about a year or more with little injection, the earthquakes subside. They start injecting and the earthquakes came back. A number of scientists um, at the US Geological Survey, scientists who I had the, the, the pleasure to work with early in my career, uh, worked on this problem. And then, uh, not long after, um, Chevron was operating uh, an oil field in western Colorado, was injecting water at very high pressure, and they noticed they were triggering earthquakes. They called the USGS, and in collaboration, Chevron and the USGS did an experiment that became known as a, an experiment in earthquake control. And as they modulated the injection and the pressure went up and down, they could turn the earthquakes on and off. The, way, the reason this happens, and it's a simple equation, if, if we think about an earthquake as sliding on a fault, the, the sliding is caused by what's called the shear stress, okay, that acts parallel to the fault, and it's resisted by what's called the normal stress, which acts perpendicular to the fault. Now, that normal stress is actually kind of the, the, the stress, the force in the rock, minus the pore pressure, the fluid that's uh, the fluid pressure in the cracks and the pores. And if you raise the pore pressure, you kind of push the plates apart a little bit, and you allow that fault 
to occur. So this, these triggered earthquakes are earthquakes that would have occurred naturally someday, but we just make it easier for them to occur because we're changing the pore pressure, reducing that normal stress, and allowing the slip to occur. Now, we've been injecting a lot more water lately. Uh, my colleague uh, at the USGS, uh, Bill Ellsworth, published a paper last year showing that throughout the central and eastern United States, there's, you can see the red line indicates sort of the rate at which earthquakes above um, magnitude 3 were occurring for many decades. And then suddenly, uh, around the year 2000, and especially in the last five years, the rate of earthquakes in this entire region has increased dramatically. And that's exactly the same time period over which shale gas has been developed, and the amount of injection has increased. So is fault movement in response to large-scale water injection something to be concerned about? And the answer to that question is yes as well. We, we forget that when we look at a map that shows these little dots representing earthquakes, we're really looking at a snapshot in geologic time, right? These, these networks have been operating for a few decades. And if you look at Asia, for example, West China has far more earthquakes than, than Eastern China. Um, but some of the biggest earthquakes, most devastating earthquakes in history have occurred in eastern China. And those red dots, if you can see them, represent places where dams were built, water uh, reservoirs were impounded, and the very small pore pressure change at depth has triggered, has triggered earthquakes. So the stress in the earth is really high everywhere, and if we perturb it too much, um, you know, earthquakes can, can be triggered that would someday have occurred um, anyway. So what normally happens then is we, you know, we, we drill a horizontal well in the shale, we trigger these tiny little microearthquakes. they don't account for much. Occasionally, a larger fault is, is intersected and we might get a hydraulically, uh, uh, excuse me, an earthquake triggered during hydraulic fracturing, but they're extremely rare. Um, but more typically what happens is, is, is the wastewater. See, the hydraulic fracturing you know, only goes on for a couple of hours. So it's a very short-term perturbation of a given section of a well. Then they move to another section and hydraulically fracture that. Wastewater injection can go on for years. And normally, it too is OK. But occasionally, a wastewater injection well will intersect some faults at depth, will connect to a fault down in the crystalline basement rock, and will then trigger you know, one of these earthquakes. And that's what's been happening. It's the uh, wastewater injection that's caused, caused the problem. So the title of that paper um, I wrote in 2012 was on how do we manage the risk? And I adopted um, a, a strategy used by the geothermal industry. Uh, stop, stop, stoplights are something everyone can understand, and green means everything is fine, and yellow means uh, hit the accelerator and get through before it turns red, right? Um, yellow means something's going on, so let's pay a little bit more attention, and red means hey, uh, what's going on um, is problematic, and we, um, and we should stop what we're doing. And that's, of course, the big question. When, do we, uh, when are we sufficiently concerned? And so I'll use the Guy, Arkansas case as an example. There were two injection wells, and the earthquakes started, and they migrated in this northeast, south, southwest direction um, uh, as you know, very close and right after they started the injection. So the spatial and temporal correlation was really quite, quite good. Steve Horton, a geologist uh, at the, a seismologist at the USGS in Memphis, rushed out, put out some seismometers so we have good earthquake locations. And when we put this into a sort of a regional context, what we see is that the fault that was getting turned on looked just like the faults um, this uh, area in central Arkansas uh, is, is where this is happening. But you know, about 100 miles to the northeast, three very large earthquakes occurred early in the 19th century on faults with exactly the same orientation. So that situation, even though the largest earthquake was a 4.7, it was widely felt, really caused no, no damage uh, at all, the potential for a larger earthquake existed, and uh, the, the, the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission asked the uh, people doing the injection to stop. They did. The earthquakes went away. And so we kind of understand this process. And to manage it effectively, we have to avoid injection into potentially active faults. 
Now there are about 150,000 EPA class two, which describes these kinds of wastewater injection wells, uh, class two wells operating in the United States and have been for many decades with a few problems. But not in even one case was anyone asked to do a geologic site characterization. And so, you know, with so many wells and now the amount of injection increasing, you know, some of the wells were located near potentially active faults. The pressure is the problem, and you can't inject too much, right? If you inject a small amount, then, then the formation into which you're injecting it can accommodate the volume. If you inject too much, the problem, the, the problem goes up. You have to have good seismic monitoring. So if something happens, you know what's happening, and you can assess the risk. And when the risk is too great, you need to be prepared to abandon some injection wells.